Well, good morning and welcome to the live stream Easter Sunday service on behalf of St Andrew the Great here in the city centre in Cambridge. We're a Christian church family of all ages and stages. Some people who live in Cambridge all year round, others who join us for some of the year as students here. And we're an international family, people from all sorts of parts of the world, all together, all united, all one in Christ Jesus. Normally, of course, we love to meet together on Sundays in our St Andrew the Great building. But as with hundreds of thousands of other churches all over the world, at the moment we're having to meet very differently. And today, picture in your mind's eye, many people uh, tuning into this in their homes uh, around the city in Cambridge, and even some of our international members tuning in from, uh, from their home countries where they've, uh, they've gone back uh, for Easter. If we haven't met before, my name's Alistair Payne, I'm the Minister of the Church, and I welcome you on behalf of all our regular members to this service. Now, one of the great bedrock facts about Jesus of Nazareth is that he's not simply a dead hero of history, but he's alive today. It's the great fact which we celebrate particularly every Easter Sunday, and it underpins so much else. And I invite you to say with me some great words of affirmation, which you should see pop up on the screen. And uh, I want to hear you shout it from your houses around the city. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's say these words together from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Let's sing a great Easter hymn together. Thine be the glory.
It's time for us to pray together now, and our prayers this morning are going to be led by the Lowe family, that is Rob and Helen and Emily and Harriet, who've been members of our church family at St Andrew the Great for quite a few years. Just before they lead us in prayer, I thought I'd ask them a couple of questions. First of all, a question for Emily and Harriet, which is, how are you coping with being at home the whole time? It's challenging at times because I miss my school friends, but it's fun at the same time because you get to spend more time with your family. Like Hattie said, I've also been finding it challenging, but I've been lucky enough to have the technology to um, stay in contact with school and church friends via FaceTime and messages and things like that. I've also had um, one call from my teacher, which has made me very happy. She's just been asking after me. and. Overall, even though it isn't the same as meeting someone face to face, it has made me feel more at ease. And then a question for Rob and Helen. You've got a very big life change coming up for your family quite soon, involving work and home and lots of stuff. Um, what's it going to be and how are you coping with the change in these rather unusual circumstances? So, yeah, the lows are emigrating to Australia. Um, I've been offered a job um, with Christian Schools Australia, um, supporting uh, heads and principals across Victoria and Tasmania. Um, but for obvious reasons, we can't leave now. Um, but I've got a very understanding employer who has allowed me to work very remotely um, from my study just back there. It means early morning starts and late finishes. Um, but I'm just really thankful to have a job um, in the current climate I'm really privileged to be able to support teachers and leaders um, running schools um, for our most vulnerable people and our key workers um, at this very challenging time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you give us choices each and every day. This week we have seen your path before us and turned away from it. We've seen our brother and sister in need and we did not turn to help, however costly that might be. We've said cruel or unkind words or stopped short of saying kind and helpful words when they were needed. We've used our resources, gifts from you, to help only ourselves. We give you thanks that in spite of ourselves, you show your love to us in many ways, each and every day. You promise to forgive us when we come to your feet and say sorry. So let us do that now. You'll find a short prayer we can say together printed on the service sheet if you downloaded that, and the words will also appear on the screen. Perhaps you will join us when I say the word together. If you agree, you might respond with, Lord, hear us and help us. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, risen master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection and your mercy. Forgive us together. Lord, Lord hear, hear us, us and, and help, help us. us. We've lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us together. Lord, Lord hear, hear us, us and, and help, help us. us. We have lived for this world alone and ignored you. In your mercy, forgive us together. Lord, Lord hear, hear us, us and, and help, help us. us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We give you thanks for sending your son through whose death we receive pardon and through whose resurrection we have hope. Let us continue now in prayer together. Dear God, thank you for this Easter Sunday and the reminder that you conquered death to give us new life. Thank you that you are merciful and forgives us our sins when we don't deserve it. Thank you that the Bible shows us we no longer need to fear death as Christians because you sent Jesus to die for us and rise again. Thank you that we can look forward to a perfect eternal life. We are sorry when we think that we are in charge 
and try to live our own lives without you. Amen. 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 Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your creation and all the signs of new life. Thank you that we have been able to enjoy beautiful weather this week despite the lockdown. Thank you for the Lord, for the NHS and the amazing care provided by the doctors, nurses and key workers. Please continue to protect them during this time. Amen. 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 Our merciful and loving Father, we thank you this Easter Sunday that we can pray to a God who is real and rules over our whole world. At this time of great sadness and worry over the coronavirus pandemic, we are reminded of our frailty here on earth. But thank you that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the gift of eternal life if we believe and trust in you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help bring an end to the spread of the virus and that lives would be saved. Please continue to make leaders of different countries affected by the virus wise. Help them to make decisions which will help to save lives. And please, with people living around the world, obey the rules. We pray for economic relief for countries who are really struggling financially. We particularly pray today for our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who is very sick with the virus. We know that in your mercy you can heal. So we pray that he would recover quickly so he can lead the country again. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish our time of prayer by saying a creed together. This is a short summary uh, based on today's Bible reading. The heart of what we as Christians believe. This Easter day, if this is something you can affirm in your own heart, and it is something you want to remind your fellow Christians, Christian brothers and sisters of. Let's say this together. Once again, those words we found on the service sheet um, and will appear on the screen together. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles, this we have received, and this we believe. Amen. Time to sing again together now, and this next song is a song all about the Bible, which we're going to be reading together shortly. Inside 
It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it to make us whole Alex Kamashi is going to read the Bible to us now. He's going to read from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. But just before you do that, Alex, I wanted to ask you, how are you and your family coping with the lockdown and how you managing to do your work? Thank you very much, Alistair. My name is Alexander Komashi, and I have been part of this church for about 10 years now. I am married to Meili, and we have two children Yaira and Caleb. The lockdown hasn't been too bad for us. Um, it took a while to get used to. I'm able to work well from home and our daughter has stopped complaining about wanting to go back to nursery. Our Bible reading for today is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 15 and we read from verse 1 to verse 28. Before we read, let's pray for Robbie who will be explaining God's word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for adding this day onto our lives and for the privilege of being able to listen to your word preached. We pray for your Holy Spirit's help for Robbie as he explains your word to us. We ask that you will give him great clarity that he might be able to help us to see Christ on the pages of your scriptures. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are a young person, I hope you will be able to pay particular attention to how many people saw Jesus Christ after he was raised from the dead. You may want to add up and perhaps tell your parents about your total number. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to save us and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of all the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, by the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. 
And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For us in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who puts everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Can I add my welcome to Alistair's? My name is Robbie. I'm on the staff team here at St. Andrew the Great. And whoever you are, it is lovely that you've joined us, whether you're young or old, whether you're a regular with us, or whether this is your first time tuning in. We're going to be spending some time looking at that passage from 1 Corinthians 15 that Alex just read for us. So if you have got a Bible, it might be worth keeping it open just so that you can also follow along. It's also a talk for all ages, so if you want a better view of the screen, why don't you come a bit closer and make sure that you can see. Now, I love Easter, partly because it's so beautiful outside at this time of year, but also because of the amazing food. Who had chocolate eggs for breakfast? I think Easter beats Christmas hands down when it comes to food. But the main reason that I love Easter is because as Christians, we remember that Jesus Christ is not dead, but alive. Jesus is alive. Now that might sound a little bit strange, like one of those conspiracy theories on the internet. Elvis Presley is alive. Elvis was a famous American singer from the 1950s and 60s, and he died in 1977. But some people online think that Elvis is still alive. They've all got all sorts of evidence. Perhaps he's a groundskeeper working in America. Perhaps he wanted to live a life of seclusion. Apparently he was into self-isolation before it became cool. Or, this is the weirdest one, he appeared as an extra on the film Home Alone. Now it does look a little bit like him to be fair, but seriously. Now there are lots of differences between Elvis Presley and Jesus Christ. Not least this one. If Elvis is alive, well I guess, you know, that's good news for his family and friends. But he'd be about 85 years old now, and it doesn't really make that much difference to me and you. But if Jesus Christ is alive, well, that makes all the difference in the world. It means hope in the face of crisis. It means hope and life in the face of death. It means a promise of life beyond the grave of this world and these bodies made new because of the astonishing claims that Jesus made. If he is alive, well, that changes everything. And if he didn't rise from the dead, well, look at verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Now, I've been playing a lot of Jenga in lockdown. The thing about Jenga is that one little brick makes all the difference. If you take out one thing, the whole of it comes tumbling down. And Christianity is the same. If you take out the resurrection, then there's not much good news left, really. If Jesus isn't alive, 
we might as well give up and go home. Well, we're already at home, so whilst we're here, because it matters so much, why don't we spend some time thinking about the evidence? Is Jesus Christ alive or not? Have a look down with me at verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Here's evidence number one. Jesus really died. Look down at verse 3. Christ died for our sins. And verse 4, he was buried. Now, Roman soldiers were really good killers. Nobody survived crucifixion. One eyewitness of Jesus actually tells us that the Roman soldiers poked a spear in his side just to check that he was dead. And when they took him down from the cross, they buried him in a tomb and rolled a huge heavy stone over the entrance. Now this is important because it means that Jesus didn't pass out and then wake up and run away. How could someone who'd been through so much pain and not drunk anything for three days move that heavy stone? He was really dead. That's evidence number one. Here's the second bit of evidence. The empty tomb. When some women came to the tomb early on Easter morning, they found nothing there. And here's the question. What happened to Jesus' body? The disciples didn't steal it. In Matthew's Gospel, we're told that the Pharisees had remembered that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. And because they didn't want people spreading that rumour, they got some guards and stood them in front of the tomb to stop his followers from stealing the body. So his followers didn't steal it. And the Romans and the Pharisees didn't steal it either. Otherwise, when the rumours started spreading, why didn't they just uh, bring the body out? Here's the third bit of evidence. He appeared to many. Have a look down again at verse 5 and 6. Did you count how many people he appeared to? It's well over 500, isn't it? As one of Jesus' followers says a little bit later on, this wasn't done in a corner. Jesus' resurrection appearances were public. Lots of people saw them. And the testimony that we've received comes straight from the lips of the eyewitnesses. Here's the final bit of evidence. Evidence number four. All of this was predicted hundreds of years beforehand. Look at the verses again. Did you see that two times it says, according to the scriptures, verse 3, and also verse 4. In the Old Testament, it was predicted that when Jesus came, he would die and suffer and rise again, just like he did. It's even down to tiny details, like this one example, where it promises that he would be given wine vinegar to drink and that soldiers would throw dice for his clothes. Now, some people think that these bits of evidence are silly. It's kind of like Elvis Presley and the Home Alone film. Surely this is the kind of thing that fans of Jesus would make up. And they say things like, well, I'll believe when I can see it for myself. Well, look, just because I didn't see something doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And if Jesus' disciples knew that it was all made up, well then, why would they literally give up their lives trying to persuade people that it was true? Jesus is alive is something that Christians have believed right from the very beginning. In fact, scholars actually think that these verses, 3 to 8, are part of an original creed, which would have been around in early Christianity from the very first few months after Jesus' death, and resurrection. It's one of the oldest bits of the New Testament. Look, you might be a bit sceptical about all this. I'd encourage you to look into it more. Lee Strobel was an investigative journalist from America, or he still is an investigative journalist, but he used to be an atheist in the 1980s. 
He was very skeptical about the claims of Christianity. One morning, his daughter came to him and said, I've become a Christian. And he was pretty shocked and said, look, how can I persuade you out of this? I don't want you messing around with that Christian stuff. And she said to her dad, if you can persuade me that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then I'll stop being a Christian. So Lee Strobel spent a year and nine months trying to do just that, examining all the evidence for himself. And eventually he became persuaded that Jesus really did rise from the dead and he put his trust in him. His book actually is well worth a read, particularly if you've got a bit more time now, we're in lockdown. So there's four big bits of evidence. Can you remember them? Jesus really was dead. The tomb really was empty. He appeared to many people. And all of this was predicted way beforehand in the Old Testament. The evidence is in. Jesus really did rise from the dead. He's alive. Christian hope is not some crazy conspiracy theory. Our faith is not futile. It's not fan fiction. You and me might have wobbly days or doubting days, but we can be certain of this concrete and historic reality. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We're going to sing a song now all together before we come back for another little bit of the talk. It's from our friends at Awesome Cutlery again, and it's called He Has Risen. I hope you'll join in. Jesus was alone with his disciples He told them of the things to come The Son of Man will die but rise up three days later They didn't understand him What did he say? sense on that the day Jesus He has risen Death is not the end Jesus He has risen To the throne He's coming back to to a cross outside the city They crucified him with two thieves One asked, Lord, please remember me when in your kingdom All those who trust the Son have eternal life Today with me
that's a catchy song, isn't it? We've seen that Jesus really is alive. And this makes all the difference in the world. Verse 20, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. It makes a difference to two really big things. Jesus smashes sin and he defeats death. You've caught me on my daily outdoor time. I'm on a bit of a run through uh, Mill Road Cemetery in Cambridge. I wonder if you've ever been here. Even on a beautiful spring afternoon like this, graveyards and cemeteries can be quite scary places. We don't like the idea of death. Don't worry, adults are scared by it too. Death is the great taboo in our culture. That means we don't really like talking about it. I reckon there's a few things we do to death in the 21st century world. Firstly, we deny it. It's interesting, a cemetery like this used to be right in the centre of the city. But since it's been closed, the Cambridge Creme is stuck on the outskirts, halfway up the A14. We want it out of sight and out of mind. Also, we distort it. Death is nothing at all. I've only slipped away into the next room. That's the famous poet. Um, Henry Scott Holland. But that's not true, is it? Death isn't nothing at all. It sucks. Yeah, some people die after long and happy lives, but many are taken far too early. Isn't it interesting how something like the coronavirus confronts us with some harsh realities? It reminds us that we're fragile and not in control. It makes the normal things that we live for seem small and irrelevant. But maybe most of all, it reminds us about death. Here's the harsh reality that all of us must face up to. Death has a 100% hit rate. The cemetery here is full of all sorts of people, men and women, young and old, adults and children, rich and poor, academics, shopkeepers, builders, suffragettes, doctors, policemen, even a famous cricketer. But all of them, no matter who they were in life, have come to the same fate. They're buried and forgotten. Death is relentless. It's never satisfied. Like a huge mouth that swallows up everything you put into it. It's closed, this cemetery, because it's full up. When it comes to death, we can try to deny or distort, but at the end of the day, we're left with despair. Death sucks. It's not okay. Surely this isn't how it was meant to be. Well, it's not. I better keep going on my run. But why don't you look down at verses 22 to 23? These verses take us back to another garden. Oh, so here we are in the Garden of Eden. Have a look down at verse 22 and 23. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn... Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Adam was the first man ever. But in Hebrew, Adam also means humanity. He represents or stands for all of us. Adam's big problem was sin. He turned from God and disobeyed. Remember the apple? The big problem wasn't so much eating the apple. The big problem was breaking the relationship with God. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. And if you turn from the God of life, would it make sense that the punishment is death? And everybody since Adam has died. All of humanity, like little Adams, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. Shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. Shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. Shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. In Adam, we all die. 
We're stuck in our sins. The two big problems, sin and death. But if sin and death came through one man, well, so life has come through one man as well. The second man, Jesus, wasn't like Adam. He wasn't like us. He never said, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. And he's risen to life so that we can also live. Look back at verse 22. In Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. Do you remember the big problems from Adam? Sin and death. In his death and resurrection, Jesus smashes sin and defeats death. Death doesn't need to be scary anymore. Because in Christ, death has been defeated. And one day, those who belong to him will defeat death too. He's the first fruits in verse 23. It's kind of like a dam bursting. It starts with a very little trickle and then a huge flood as the gates are opened. But where that first little water droplet goes, all the others follow. And it's like that with Jesus. Because he has defeated death, those who belong to him will defeat death too. And one day when Jesus comes back, God will place everything under his feet. Even death, that great swallower-upper, he'll swallow up forever. Look at verse 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Look, Christians do still face suffering and death, even in this life. Some people in our church family are sick right now. Some may even die because of the coronavirus. And when a Christian dies, there is sadness, of course. But there is also hope. It's what makes Christian funerals so unique. Many of us experienced this a few months ago at the funeral of a church family member called Johnny Kingsman. It was such a sad occasion, of course. But the funeral was also marked by a deep hope. We know that death was not the end for Johnny because death was not the end for Jesus. So what difference does Jesus' resurrection make? It makes all the difference in the world. No other religion offers hope for these bodies and this world. Nothing else can give us hope in the face of crisis or death. This virus might fill us with fear and worry and despair. But look, if Christ got through death itself, then that means one day those who belong to him will too. Back in Mill Road Cemetery, one of the gravestones is for a man called William Edwin Beaumont. Now, I don't know much about him, but his inscription says this, Asleep in Christ waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? It's actually where the word cemetery comes from. It's the Greek word for dormitory, a place where people sleep. For people who belong to Jesus, death is not the end, because death was not the end for him. So as we finish, I've got two questions for you. What do you think of Jesus' astonishing claim that he's alive and risen from the dead? I don't know who you are or what kind of experiences you've had. I don't know where you're tuning in from, whether you'd call yourself a Christian 
or whether you're new to some of these things. This has been an all-age service, but it's an all-age claim. Whether Jesus is alive makes a difference if you're five or 95. If it's true, it changes everything. Do you belong to him? I'd encourage you to explore more if you are looking into this for the first time and perhaps join us at some of our small group meetings during the week. If you are already somebody who belongs to Jesus, here's the question for you. Do you have a resurrection shaped faith? One of the verses that particularly struck me as I was preparing this was verse 19. Just glance down at it. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pities. One of the sad things about the present situation is that lots of things that are great about being a Christian, that we love about church family, have been snatched away from us. We can no longer sing together. We can no longer meet together. We're not able to see our Christian friends and family. It's a really hard thing. But maybe one good thing about the virus is that it forces us as Christians to remember that our hope is not in this life, it's future focused. It isn't found ultimately in the things that we get to enjoy about being a Christian now, which we so often take for granted. Our faith is a resurrection faith. Jesus Christ is alive. This changes everything. Will you let him change you? Let me pray. Our loving Father, we thank you so much that Jesus is alive. Our faith is not futile. And you have dealt with the problem of sin and death. And Father, we pray that this resurrection faith would change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our last song is an absolute cracker. It's called See What a Morning. And as we sing this, please let's reflect on what this tells us about what happened on that first Easter day and the wonderful good news that that brings for you and for me. Thank you.
pray together as we conclude our service. Verse again from 1 Corinthians 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you raised your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in power from the dead. We thank you that he is alive today to be our friend, our Lord and our Saviour. We thank you that his resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection, that just as he was raised, so those who have trusted in him will be raised to glory. Thank you that he has defeated death, drawing its sting. Help us now, we pray, to live for you in obedience and love. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, that's it for the, uh, the 10 o'clock live stream today. We'll be back together at five o'clock this evening. I invite you to, uh, to tune in then. Our guest speaker is Glenn Scrivener, and he's going to be speaking about the surprising encounter that Mary Magdalene had with Jesus in the garden on the first Easter Sunday. See you then.